Welcome to Longmont Voices and Vision, a project of Longmont Public Media. In the midst of the darkest period in our lives, when we're bombarded 24 hours a day with news of the coronavirus and the human and economic carnage it's causing in our society, we're challenged to cope with our fears and anxieties while remaining hopeful about what lies on the other side of this crisis. This project presents an opportunity for Longmont residents to share with others how they're adjusting to new realities of social distancing and the kind of future they hope to experience on the other side of the crisis. I'm Tim Waters, host of these conversations and a Longmont Public Media volunteer. In this series, I'll be asking Longmont residents, many of them your friends and neighbors, three questions. What are you doing to get through this crisis? Even though we cannot be together right now, how are we staying connected to friends and families? And what's the future you are hoping to see and experience on the other side of this crisis? I hope you'll stay with this series and enjoy listening to your friends and neighbors and learn from them how they're getting through and what they're looking forward to in a new reality on the other side. Stephen Krieger, thank you for your contribution to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. Uh, we appreciate your contribution here, and we're going to hear just in a second about what you do with your life. So thank you for your contributions when you're not being interviewed for all the other things you do in the world. So tell us about that. Tell us who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for asking me to do this, Tim. I'm really excited and really grateful that you would that you'd ask. Uh, so I am a pastor at Flatirons Community Church. Um, I'm what's called a campus pastor, so I lead our Longmont community. Um, so my role is a little bit of just caring for the people who are part of Flatirons Longmont uh, and also trying to help lead our campus towards uh, serving and connecting with our Longmont community and also to a, to a lesser degree of the Tri-Cities and Loveland because we have a lot of people who are living all around yeah. but especially we want to figure out like hey how do we connect with and serve our Longmont community not just the people who are part of our church not the, just the people who might be part of our church like people who never will even hear about Flatirons how do we how do we make sure we're caring for them and serving them in in kind of the way that I think Jesus would want to. Well um, I, we know you have I know most of us know you have members of your congregation all over Longmont and, and up and down the front range. Uh, it's a, been, it become quite a successful uh, uh, community of, of, of faith uh, in the front range. Yeah. So you know, uh, so thanks for that. And you know that I'm going to ask you three questions. The first of the three questions is, is this. Uh, in a time with um, all of the unknowns uh, and, the, and the fear that goes with those unknowns that we're dealing with as this pandemic has materialized, um, uh, as people are trying to figure out how to get themselves through it, how are you getting yourself through this period of time? Yeah, it's a great question. Oh man. Um, I mean, I obviously like being part of a faith community, like faith is really big for me. Um, so that is that, honestly, that is a big part of, of how I kind of process it and get through it. Like, I just think that, um, that God is really good, that he's in control and he's going to take care of me, whether I get horribly sick and whether my family gets horribly sick or whether I stay healthy. Um, I don't think that means it's going to be easy. I just think that means that he cares about me. Um, and on the, on the other side of that, when I really early on, um, I have a connection to a guy who, who leads a nonprofit down in Mexico, who is just brilliant. Like he's trying to help develop slum cities down there. And he, he wrote an article, like an essay on like, hey, how do you respond to this crisis? Um, and he quoted a couple different people, but one of the people he quoted was Martin Luther, the guy who started the Protestant Reformation. Um, and it was during an outbreak of the Black Plague and someone else had asked him like, hey, what, I'm a pastor, what should I do? Like, how do, like, can I run away? Like, do I have to like go to everyone's house? Like, how do I handle this? And he was like, I don't know, I mean, if you ask me how I'm going to handle it, like I'm going to sanitize my house. I'm going to stay away from places where I don't need to be so that I don't get someone else sick and so that I don't get sick and infect my family or then go and infect other people. 
but then I'm going to make sure that if I see a chance to take care of my neighbor, I'm not going to be afraid to do it. Like I'm going to go do it. Um, and so part of the way I process this season is like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of introverted anyway. So like staying home doesn't really hurt. I'm, I actually like it. Uh, but also the way I've processed it is like, I'm staying home and I'm, I'm giving up some convenience and some freedom, not just to like protect myself or just to protect my family, but like to care for the other people around me. Like if I stay in and don't get infected and don't spread that infection, like I'm taking care of my neighbors, I'm taking care of my parents, I'm taking care of my community and making sure that um, other people are going to stay healthier because I'm avoiding contact. Right. Question number two, in a time when we can't be physically together, uh, how are you staying connected to family and friends? Yeah, lots of Zoom calls. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had uh, early on, I don't know that my wife and I did this real well, um, but as time has gone on, we've kind of been really intentional about reaching out to people, especially people who are in our circle, who are living alone or uh, who are, you know, maybe they're with roommates, but they can't be around them very much or something like that. Um, because we kind of heard a statistic that people who were living alone were, were some of the people who were struggling the most in this season. Um, you know, and that was, that kind of made, makes sense to me. <laughs> you know, uh, cause, cause they're dealing with isolation. Um, and so since then we've done a lot of zoom calls, especially with, um, like our parents and, um, you know, family members or friends who are, who are on their own. We started reading a book with one of our friends. Um, so like not obviously not at the same time, but like, we're just all reading it together. And so I, we'll talk about it at some point and we're, you know, texting about it, but that's kind of a, cool little like oh we can stick together on this um playing categories over over uh, zoom which is also great um and then just generally like a lot more texting a lot more like sending back pictures and videos and a little bit more social media but i feel like it's I, again honestly i feel like it's been really good and for some of those people i'm more connected than i was before the pandemic hit there you go. You know, my third question is based on the presumption that whatever life looks like once we get beyond the pandemic, whenever that time is, it's going to be different from what was normal before the pandemic. Yeah. So the question is, assuming that whatever, whatever the new normal is, is different, what would you like to see and what are you willing to help create as a new normal? Yeah, that's such a great question. Well, I think the, the things that I have seen come out of this season most that I just absolutely love are honestly kind of that, what I was talking about in that first question, um, like the idea that everything I'm doing right now, staying in, ordering in, getting my groceries taken out to me instead of going into the store, like all of those are ways of serving people around me in my mind you know um and that kind of like purpose and everything is is so life-giving um and so for me personally like i want to figure out like hey how do i do that but then beyond that like how do i help other people get that same kind of mentality like where you can have purpose in everything you're doing like you know how i'm driving to work or what time i'm leaving for work is there a way i can make it so, hey, I'm, I'm actually maybe making some other people's lives easier by leaving half an hour later or half an hour earlier. Um, and so that's on like a really small scale. Um, on a bigger scale, I've loved watching our, like the staff at Flatiron Longmont. Um, I've loved watching them kind of figure out how to connect with our community well. So, you know, we're, we're doing some interviews with people around the community, business leaders, uh, city leaders, um, you know, people who are artists or just anyone um, and not even talking about like faith or, um, you know, issues that are that happen within our church, but just like, hey, would you tell us like, what's the best way to paint an Easter egg? Or like, hey, can you tell us what it's like to be 
someone running a business in this season. Um, and that's just felt so cool. And that kind of human connection that is so far past kind of what the old normal was and a, like a high level of empathy for what people are going through. Um, if we can keep cultivating that, I feel like we're going to, we're going to win. Like we're all going to win if, if we can keep cultivating that kind of emotion. Um, and then again, on like a, on a smaller scale, like it's been really, you were talking about this, I think before we started recording, um, we have three small kids, you know? So at some point there's a solid chance you're going to hear one of them walk in or throw a fit or something. Um, and they, they're absolutely wonderful and they're absolutely crazy. And you know, 80% of the time they are the best thing in the world. And 20% of the time I don't know what to do with them, you know, <laughs> but, um, but I think slowing down in my life and finding a little extra time to hang out with my kids, you know, taking a break from work. And instead of going to the water cooler and chatting, I'm getting to go outside and play tag um, or, you know, cutting out the commute time so I can, be here right when dinner starts and get to hang out with them. I think those have been things that are really, really special and really healthy. And so I'm trying to figure out how do I pass that on? Like, I can't do that for everybody, but how do I pass that on to my staff? Like, how do I keep that? How do I, the people who are, are working with me and for me, like, how can I make it so that they can have more of that time? You know, whether that's telecommuting or whether it's, you know, telling them to, Hey, take, take a half day here so that you can go get some of that time with your, with your families. Um, because I've seen from my family, it's been, it's been very, we've come together a lot in this season because we've had to, right. We've had some really good fights all around the family. <laughs> like that's, that's just going to happen. But I don't think that, you know, I'm sure a lot of people feel guilty or feel frustrated about fighting with their, with their spouse or their family in this season, but like, that's just the reality. Like, that's just you working out some boundaries and working out some issues. And I think being forced into that and not having the escape of, okay, well, I'm gonna head to work or, you know, I've got to send some text messages here. Like you don't have that escape now. So now it's like, okay, well, let's face this. Let's work through it. Let's be, be together here. So I want to cultivate that for us. I want to cultivate that for the people who work for me. And if I can encourage anybody else too, I will. Stephen, great contributions to this project, uh, writ large and specifically with uh, your contribution in this interview. So uh, yeah. I want to uh, say thank you again for lending your voice and your vision to this project. Absolutely. Uh, I want to uh, encourage you to take care of yourself, stay safe, and our paths will cross in, in person when, we can, when we're able to get back out in the world again. Sounds great, Tim. Thanks again for letting me be part of it. All right. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks. Rick Evers, thank you uh, for your contribution to the Longmont Voices and Vision Project. And thank you as well, uh, not just for your contributions to this interview this morning, but for all of the contributions you make to this community. And uh, I'm going to ask you to talk about yourself. And I'm, and I'm hoping you're going to share some of those so people have an idea who they're hearing from. So tell us about you. Uh, well, first of all, Tim, thanks for letting me be a part of this. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm a pastor here in town uh, for a church called The Journey of Longmont. We moved here 21 years ago to actually start that church. Um, and amazingly enough, 21 years later, we still get to be here. And uh, they, still let me, they still let me do this job. And it's uh, fantastic. Uh, one of the things that I talk about in my work is uh, I talk about being uh, – I don't know if this is a good connotation or a bad connotation, but the idea of being a missionary pastor. And the idea behind that is that my, my job, my task, my hope was not simply to come to Longmont, start another church where we just huddle in a bunch of people and we all just take care of ourselves. Um, certainly there's an aspect in which, you know, you want a church community to be able to be a group of people that take care of each other. That's part of community. But we really wanted to be uh, a church that um, was a church for our community. So one of the, one of the scripture passages uh, that has really resonated with us over the years is out of Jeremiah 29, and a lot of people know part of that, which is I know the plans I have for you, the plans for you, and 
uh, you know, make you flourish. Um, that one we always want to hang on to because it's like, that it makes you feel good. Like, oh, good. We're going to get good stuff out of God. But uh, <laughs> there's a different part of that passage, actually, that comes before it. Um, the context of the passage is actually Israel's getting ready to go into, into captivity. And then God's like, look, when you get there, um, plant gardens, get married, have kids, uh, have your kids have kids. In other words, you're going to be here a while. So settle down. And then it says this, and pray for the prosperity or the blessing of your city, because if it prospers, you prosper. And to be able to be a place that says we really wanted to be a church that was for Longmont. We got enough people that are against stuff. We wanted to be for Longmont and be able to go, look, there's, there's a beauty that comes with God's order. And so let's be a place and let's be a church that helps build order out of in the, in the middle of chaos. And so one of the things that that's allowed me to do is I've, I've been really fortunate in 20 years of doing this, that we've had leaders in our church that have been like, okay, Rick, then be in the community, right? Then be a pastor that's uh, for the church. Be, in fact, uh, if we can use some old words on this, it's like figure out what it means to be a parish priest again. In other words, it's like, look, don't just be a pastor to our church. Figure out how to be a pastor to the community. And so um, one of the things that I've been doing for 20 years, we just passed a 20 year mark, is I've been involved with the Longmont Police and Fire Chaplaincy. It's a volunteer program that uh, got started you know, several years before I came on the scene and I was fortunate enough to become a part of and get involved in because of, of a guy named Bill Lee. And uh, just really grateful for Chief Butler um, and the command staff of both the police and fire for uh, embracing this program and embracing us as chaplains and me in particular. I've been really uh, been blessed to be a part of the program and it's just been a great way to be able to serve those who serve us. That's been one thing. Uh, and then about 13 years ago, uh, we got involved with um, uh, two organizations kind of simultaneously. Uh, one was when um, uh, Hope was kind of getting started in the early phase. Uh, one of our church members uh, was on the board to kind of get Hope out of Boulder and just in Longmont. Um, and then... Uh, as a part of that, there were a couple of other churches that were uh, a ministry and another church that were involved in sheltering homeless. They were just kind of like, look, they got no place to go. We actually had one of our uh, Longmont residents who was homeless um, die of exposure. And that really sparked the catalyst with a couple of these other churches. Um, uh, Gary Jefferson, who's part of uh, um, Front range, Front range Christian Fellowship, which is on the north end of town, and uh, a, a different ministry called The Well. Um, and they started CORES, which is Community Outreach Emergency Shelter. So that was kind of like the first initial one. And, and this guy, this member from Hope said, hey, can we just use our, can we use the facility to help be part of housing? And it, it just made sense. So I want to make sure I give that history because it's not like somehow we are like, oh, we need to house. It was really along the idea that somebody came up with this idea uh, and we were really grateful to be a part of it. And go, yeah, we, this makes sense. We got a building. It's not getting used as much as we'd like. Let's make sure it gets used. So there's my wife going. This, this is what I get for picking this spot. That, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes on in these interviews, Rick, <laughs> behind, behind the interviewees so, and, and in my own house. For posterity's sake, yeah. right? My, my wife will love this. So anyway, um, yeah, and, and, and let's be honest, could not do the work that I'm doing, the work that we're doing. This has very much been, you know, Gwen and I in the early days from the beginning, and she's just been amazing um, to, to be a part of all of this. So, um, but it, yeah, so, so we've been uh, part of emergency sheltering of homeless in Longmont for 13 years. And then uh, a little over three years ago, we made a shift uh, to um, we made a shift to partnering with Hope directly uh, and working with navigation and all of the kind of the most more recent changes with how we do uh, sheltering here in Boulder County and particularly in Longmont. So uh, we're really grateful. I mean, Hope 
fantastic partners. In fact, one of the nice things about having Open is that they've been able to uh, really keep up our services. Uh, prior to this, um, services were very much a band aid. It was like you know, the weather was horrible and only from a from part of the season to another. And now Hope is able to provide kind of year round services and uh, it, it, it's been a terrific partner. So uh, I, I've tried to minimize my comments in these interviews because it's exactly. really about your stories. Right. Uh, but I have to say, um, uh, if there was ever a time in the history of this town or any town when the very services you've just described and uh, increasing scope and intensity and accessibility has been has been critical to so many lives it's right now yeah, yeah. with this population Absolutely. so thank you for that as well yeah so oh, yeah um so you know i'm going to ask you three questions yeah. the first is in this time of physical uh, separation and social distancing how are you getting through this? Uh, what can people learn from you and what are you learning about yourself? Oh, well, what I'm learning about myself is that uh, as an extrovert, I am extremely grateful for uh, additional video platforms. So as, <laughs> so, so as much as I get, like everybody else, I get Zoomed out. In fact, we have, we're supposed to have a staff meeting on Wednesday night. And uh, we just like we only and, like I'm the only full time staff. We got a couple of part time staff and volunteer staff, right? And uh, we want to call them staff. There's people in charge of programs, but we meet together once a month. And we're <laughs> kind of like, ah, the last thing I want is another Zoom meeting, right? So I send out an email and we're like, hey, everybody good with just taking this month check in? I mean, I'll call each one individually, uh, which will be just nicer to have that conversation. But we're just going to cancel the meeting. And I kid you not, the bat was like. Thank you. <laughs> so on the one hand, I think, you know, what, what are we like five, six weeks into this? And, uh, and, and there's a certain level of um, video platform fatigue, Zoom fatigue, right? On the other hand, man, that has been a gift. Uh, what, a, what a tremendous gift that's been uh, just from, a, uh, from the fact that I, I need to talk to people. And so, the, uh, you know, my wife is working from home. And uh, so she is the office. And as you see, I have the dining room, the kitchen. Right? <laughs> um, but it's been, it's been good, right? We, we've been taking walks. Uh, we take walks. We take, when the weather's been good, we take bike rides. It's been, um, it's been amazing that way, just to, which, we, which is a normal part of our routine anyway. But, we, but it's kind of like, Okay, it's midday. In fact, when I'm done with you, Tim, my wife and I are going for a walk. And then later on today, you know, at the end of the work day, we'll go for another walk. So that's been helpful. Um, on the other hand, I am, be, because I don't leave the house, I've just found myself doing more reading, um, which is nice. Um, and I've also found that, you know, in my, in my binge watching modes, uh, what we've discovered is that we need to watch uh, more cheery TV. Like prior to this, my <laughs> wife and I would be involved in TV dramas or whatever. And I'm like, oh man, I got enough. I got enough drama. I don't need any more make believe drama to add to, <laughs> to, add to it. So, you know, uh, we're kind of looking for you know more lighthearted stuff. But at the same time, I've been able to pick up just some more reading, which has actually been nice because in the last couple of years, it's been uh, busy for a variety of other reasons, and I've I've not read as much as I would have liked and as a, as, uh, as a preacher, that's not good, but certainly as a, just as an individual where it's like, man, I, my, I, it's really been nice to have my mind go to new places and have new ideas. And so even in the middle of this isolation, there's been opportunity to be able to uh, have new ideas and think more broadly and have my, and, and there's some freedom in that, right? Cause when you feel trapped in your house or in your community or in your neighborhood or whatever, um, you know, it can feel like, Oh, everything's just stagnant. And just the fact that I've been able to read more, have different voices speak into this. That's really been nice because it's kind of like an interior freedom. Um, which actually is one of those pieces that, as I look forward, like I'm going to jump to your 
third question of like one of the things that I hope to continue but for me personally that would be one of them right where I would say hey I really uh, there's again a value this wonderful value of of discovering and rediscovering interior freedom uh, even when you're feeling a little trapped on the outside well uh, for whatever it's worth listeners viewers of this interview uh, I should know that when I see you around town, which I do from time to time, uh, <laughs> when we could be out, uh, you are always studying and you're always preparing for the next sermon or the, the next initiative. Yeah. Uh, whenever I see you, you've always got your face in a book and you're making notes and you're working on something. So, uh, <laughs> you must be catching me on more Saturday mornings. <laughs> well, I'm I, I mean, I like, well, and I see you a lot. And but, that's, yeah, but the other part is like, I think that's the one of the things that I miss about this is that um, as much as I am glad for video conferencing, there's this other part though where, you know, I spend, as you know, Tim, I spend a ton of time in coffee shops, right? That's yeah. my office is, yeah. my office is the Red Frog. And, that's, uh, that's it. That's where I see you. Yeah, it is. So. That's, where, that's my office. And it has been for the last nine mm -hmm. years. And which is a beautiful thing because it's like, again, be where the people are at. And, yeah. if I, and that way, if I'm reading or studying or doing whatever, pe people can feel free to interrupt that. Mm -hmm. And ministry is all about the interruptions. But it's also this opportunity where you meet in person. And I think that's one of the things I miss is even though I love this. Mm -hmm. It's still not quite the same because if people are moving around here or they're looking yeah. at their computers doing something else, it's not the same as in person. It's not the same vibe. And, and you're always kind of trying to like read. Like I've developed a whole new skill of like reading people's nonverbal through the camera, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a skill I wanted, but I have it now. Oh, we're all learning a lot of new stuff here. <clears throat> so um, you're, you're staying connected yeah. on these kinds of yeah. Zooms and or these kinds of platforms and walking with your yeah. wife in a time when we can't be together. Are there other things you're doing to stay connected to family and friends? Yes. So, you know, um, one of the nice things is that, I mean, just family wise, my son lives in Arizona, my daughter lives in Arvada. Um, and, but the nice thing is, is that she's, she's a teacher. And so she's teaching from home. She doesn't go anywhere else. So on the weekends, she's been coming home. And that's been nice, quite frankly, to see her on a regular basis. Uh, but the other part is to have an additional person in the house. Right? So, it's always nice. But one of the things, we, we've done this a couple of times. Um, uh, and we're, I hope to do it some more. But where we've, uh, you know, the, the, the eight o'clock the howl, right? Where you're outside and you're, and you're howling with your neighbors for, uh, the, to celebrate uh, first responders and healthcare workers and the like. So uh, we hauled our fire pit out into, we just got one of those ones you can move all over the place. We just put it in the driveway and, um, and then we just built a fire and then we texted our neighbors and was like, all right, let's all stand 10 feet apart with our masks on around the fire and talk. Um, and, uh, you know, and so we got one neighbor that's on their driveway and somebody else is, you know, by my pickup and somebody else is standing, you know, over by the bushes. And then we're close to the house and the fire pits in the middle. And uh, so nobody's actually getting any warmth out of it, but, but it's nice ambiance. And then we get to just kind of catch up and talk and uh, see how everybody's doing. You know, a lot of over the fence kind of stuff. Um, and... Uh, but that's that's been another one of the things where it's just like how do you how do you stay connected to people, you know? Um, and that's been so we've a lot of just getting out, especially when it's nice, you know, a lot of where where you'd be used to standing close to people and talking, still trying to talk to people in person. Certainly our neighbors, um, and uh, you know, just from a distance and yelling, <laughs> talking, talking, talking much louder and letting the rest of the neighborhood in on the conversation. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Third question. Uh, it's it's the, the presumption under this third question is that whatever was normal for us before a pandemic and a stay at home order, when we're able to come back out and, uh, and we settle into a new normal, whatever that new normal is, likely to be different than what was normal. Life won't be the same, yeah. that's the presumption. 
So the question is, what do you want to see? What's your preferred future? And what would you like to help create as the new normal on the other side of this? Yeah. You know, Tim, one of the things that strikes me um, about uh, any time we have things go like this is it brings out the best and the worst in people. Uh, it brings out people who, um, on the one hand, they get scared and they, they need to take care of themselves and their families. And so, you know, they hoard toilet paper. So one of my preferred <laughs> futures is that people are not hoarding toilet paper in the future. So for people in posterity, uh, we, are, we, are in, we are in week six and the toilet paper aisle of all things is still bare. You know, so just like... <laughs> as far as the historical record. Yeah, yeah, as far as the historical record goes, right? Um, but so that's, that's one side, right? And so people like, like okay, I got I to gotta gather for me. <laughs> However, one of the beauties that I've seen have been the amount of emails, texts, phone calls from my neighbors, from my church going, hey, Rick, uh, do you know anybody that needs shopping done for them? Do you know people who are at risk, you know, like elderly folks that like should not be going out, uh, don't have other people to go get groceries for them or get their prescriptions or whatever else, right? So, or the other day I was outside and, um, and we were walking and then my neighbor drives by and it's like, hey, I'm on my way to Whole Foods, you know, what do you need? And the same, we've done the same. It's like, hey, guys, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to go to King Supers and we, we need to pick up a few things. Who else needs stuff? And we'll get it. And we have, and we have a, an elderly neighbor that's between us and a, a young couple that lives just one over. And, uh, you know, and it's been a little bit of arm wrestling as to who gets to help, you know, Gary and Mary T. Right? And, but I, it's like, I love that sort of stuff. And, and Tim, you might remember this, right? I mean, back in 2013, when we had the flood here in Longmont. Um, and, and on the one hand, it was difficult and it was hard. And uh, you couldn't get the places that you wanted to get to. You couldn't get to the other side of town. It took hours to go, you know, circuitous routes in order to get to where you needed to be. Um, stuff, was, stuff was on short supply because trucks couldn't get in. And people stepped up and people helped out and, and people's houses were flooded. And, and I, you know, I was, you know, we we're part of crews that were emptying people's basements and putting all of this <laughs> on driveways. And it was heart wrenching on the one hand. And on the other hand, I still have some deep friendships that started seven years ago because of the, you know, six years, six and a half years ago because of this flood. This has separated us in a lot of ways. And yet there's been, I feel like an increased intentionality around trying to help people not be isolated. And if there's one thing that I would love to see continue is that continued uh, generosity around community. Uh, you know, one of the things, <clears throat> sorry, I don't want to go into preacher mode here, but it, it's, uh, but one of the things that, that affluence does for us is actually affluence uh, separates us. Um, it puts us into our own silos because we don't need other people. Uh, that's one of the things you see when you deal with our homeless neighbors, incredible generosity as people share limited resources. But the more, the more affluent you become, the more self-sufficient you become, you don't need people. And therefore you hang on to your stuff because now you just need it for you and you're not generous with it to others. But as soon as you find yourself in a place where you're in need, then you're more willing to give up the things that you have in order to receive the things that you need. And I, there's, a, there's a part of me where it's like, for, for us to have that linger in our, in our minds, that's, that linger, that sense, no, when, I, when I'm actually in need from somebody else and they're in need for me that I get to give, that's community, right? That's this thing that, that draws us together. To actually be self-sufficient is the most damaging thing that we can do to ourselves because then we just isolate. I don't need anybody else. And now I'm stuck off on my own and, we, and I, I hate to say it, and we wonder why we have a mental illness crisis because I can be self-sufficient when we aren't designed to be self-sufficient. We are 
designed to be in community. We need each other. And the, so the beauty of one of, the, of this moment is that we actually get to see how much we actually need each other. And, and when people do that, when people come together and help each other out, uh, we actually see that it's a beautiful thing in taking care of ourselves by taking care of others. And I would love to see, man, if there is something that, that I would love to see linger and if I could continue to be a part of, that's it. The connection that comes when we actually help each other out. Rick, <clears throat> uh, let's hope that of the lessons that we are gonna learn from this experience, the, the, among the long remembered lessons are uh, the power and value of community Absolutely. and um, and and how much we need one another. Uh, and this community needs you and all your contributions. So thanks for keeps the, the, your continuing continuing to step up uh, on behalf of so many for and so often. Well, thanks, Tim. And thanks for doing this. I think this is a I think this is a tremendous um, a tremendous gift that you're giving to the community as well. So thank I appreciate you that. Much. And for all the work that you're doing, City Council, everything that's led up to that, bro, man, I greatly, greatly appreciate how you have been a, a participant in this community. Thank Just you. for listeners, I, I'm doing this as a volunteer. I know. City Council oh, I know. First. Yep. Yeah, no, no, no. This is, uh, this is, this is in a sense, I shouldn't say it. This, Tim, you've served this community in a lot of ways. Uh, I appreciate and, that. Uh, I just want to great and thank you as well. Uh, Thanks. Listen, uh, it's, it, we're, I'm looking forward to when we, when we reemerge and we can see one another at the Red Farm. In yeah, the meantime, yeah. take care of yourself, stay safe, and take care of that beautiful family. Thanks, man. All right. Bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.